Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. It's a beautiful morning, isn't it? Awesome, awesome morning. The anticipation of spring, Easter is two weeks away. Easter Sunday is two weeks away. I'm excited for Easter because we actually get to have in-person Easter services this year, which is a little bit different than even last year. But there's an anticipation that is in the air. Uh, you can feel it when you come to church. You may be able to feel it when you get out into the community. There's an anticipation, uh, really, that I think is fostered by relationships. Relationships. Relationships are so important. Uh, Before we jump into our scripture today, before we get into our one series today, I want to do something that's a little bit different. Uh, I want to give a round of applause for a couple people. Now, don't clap yet. Somebody is ready. I mean, I saw them. They're ready to go. Uh, we We have high school students that help us out every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning. So we have Jack Bryan. Jack's on, on the bass today. He's playing guitar with his dad. Uh, I'd never tell his dad this, but Jack's a better guitar player than his dad. Um, I guess I'm on, documented on that. But Jack, Jack's a, a high school student. We have Elise and Jameson that help out here. They're high school students that, that help us out. I mean, we have people uh, that help us, but we have students that help us. And I just want to do a, a huge thing for all our next-gen students. Let's just give them a round of applause. Big round of applause. Um, you know, here's the thing. We, we've been through a lot. We've been through a lot this year, but man, those kids, they've been through a lot too. And, uh, we always have students that are helping us out. Huge. Peyton Bowers, uh, who did our welcome high school student, literally four high school students that are making everything go today, which is really, really, really a cool thing. So that's an aside. Uh, what's the question that we've been asking this month? The last couple of weeks, we've been asking one question and it is this, who is your Who's your one? The big marquee over there. That's why it's there. You know, every time I look at that marquee, I think of the movies. I literally, this is funny. I had a dream the other night that Addie and I, my wife, went to the movies. We haven't been to the movies in like two years, but we went to the movies and I complained about the popcorn. I said, Addie, they changed the popcorn. Like they changed, the popcorn's no good. They changed the popcorn. But I look at that and we ask this question, who's your one? Who's the one person in your life that you pray I mean, you pray, like from the depths of your heart, you pray they would come to know Jesus. They would come to have faith that Jesus is the Son of God, that they would walk with Jesus. I mean, this is not just a temporary change. This is an eternal trajectory change that they would come to know Jesus. How awesome Jesus is, that Jesus is the Son of the Almighty God, and he gave everything for your one for your one. The way we've done this is we jumped into a passage of scripture in Luke chapter 15. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, jump into Luke chapter 15. Easiest way to do that, App Store, WC Church, bottom right-hand corner, there's the Bible. You can take notes in the app. The app has everything that you need to know about what it means to be a part of this church and get involved. But we go there, Luke chapter 15. In, the, in week one of this series, we jumped into Luke chapter 15. The very first thing you see there, the parable of the lost sheep. Last week, we did the parable of the lost coin. And today, we're going to start a two-part message on the parable of the lost son, or we may have heard of it as the prodigal son. It's a two-parter. We got a two-parter here. This week, we're going to look at really the father in the parable and the lost son, the prodigal son. Next week, we're going to look at the father yet again, but we're also going to look at the older brother because we really have three main characters in this parable. We have the father, who I would contend is the main character in this parable, even though it's entitled the prodigal son. He's our second character. And then the older brother, if you've ever read through this, the older brother is a main character within this story. The parable of the prodigal son is fascinating because it's one of Jesus' most famous stories, one of the most famous parables. It has been told across generations. It's been told across culture for the last 2,000 years. It's been retold. It's been shared both in literature, on the screen, you name it. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal story. It's a teaching of Jesus. As we get started this morning, I want to show you something that that I found uh, to be quite relevant a a couple years ago. Uh, Go ahead and show this, this image on the screen. This is an oil painting by Rembrandt that was done several hundred years ago. And this is a painting that depicts the return of the prodigal son. This oil painting, literally, it may be a little bit hard to see on the screen. If you're with us online, maybe you see this better on your television screen or on your device. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's that way because it's an oil painting. You know, it's old. It's an oil painting. But this sits on display at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. 
It's a Rembrandt painting. Now, they say a picture speaks a thousand words, so I want to do something totally different this morning. I literally want to take about 12 seconds, and I just want us to look at this painting and think to yourself, okay, what do I see here? What are the details that I see here? What are the words that come out? Okay, so we're going to take 12 seconds. You're about to see how long 12 seconds really is, and we're just going to look at this. You ready? We'll do it together. Set, go. All right, think to yourself, what do you see? I noticed two things immediately. One, I noticed his feet. His shoes are completely worn out. We're going to see why that's the case in the parable. And the second thing I noticed is the father's embrace with two hands. It's not a, it's not a COVID side hug. It's a two hands. It's an embrace. The third thing I noticed, which we'll talk about next week, is I believe the guy on the far right is the brother is the older brother. Now, Jesus didn't paint this, Rembrandt did, so this isn't holy scripture right here, but this depicts a story within scripture. So let's jump into Luke chapter 15. We'll go there. Before we go there, let me give you, let me give you a couple more resources real quick. One, I, I found a couple things that I like further reading. Um, I don't like homework, but I do like further reading. So I want to give you some resources about the parable of the prodigal son. First is a resource called Finding Your Way Back to God. Uh, Chan Man, Kevin Chan, my friend right here, you remember when we did this. So we did this book in our church about five or six years ago. Really, really cool book. It's based on the prodigal son, the return of the prodigal son. So you may find yourself in a place where you're like, I... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with God, but I'm kind of not, not with God. I, maybe you're online, you say, you know, I just need to try something different. So you came to church, whatever that is. This is a phenomenal book, phenomenal book written by Dave and John Ferguson, some guys I know that planted a church in Chicago called Community Christian Church. If you are ever in Chicago on a Sunday, you need to go to Community Christian Church. They got like eight sites around the city, phenomenal church. But they write a book about how we can find our way back to God. And they use the prodigal son as the scripture to really help that. Uh, about five or six years ago, I had a friend start a small group with this series in this church. And there are about 12 of us. There were 10 of them in the small group. And then my wife, Addie, and I just joined the small group because we knew some of these people. Here's the crazy thing. When that small group was started, if I remember this correctly, outside of my wife and I, there was one person in that group that had made their decision to be all in, follow Jesus, gave their life to Jesus and baptized, only one person. Within a year, within a year, every, no, within two years, every single person within that small group had decided to follow Jesus, had made a full decision, had said I'm all in, had been baptized and were walking with Jesus within two years. There was one that hadn't, and this one actually, I kid you not, within about six weeks of quarantine, so this would have been almost a year ago, this one person called me, it's a friend of mine, and he said, I made a deal with God, and I gotta, I gotta own up to my side of it. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, he's a financial investor, and so when COVID came in, he just watched all these things drop. And he said, I panicked and I prayed to God. I said, God, if you see me through this, no more excuses. I'm all in. And he goes, Jay, you wouldn't believe it. He saw me through it. So I'm all in. I kid you not, the next week we came in here. He gave his life to Christ. He was baptized. This is quarantine time. This is the only time this has happened. Dude baptized himself. I stood there. I had a mask. I was in the baptistry with him. I took his confession of faith. And he looked at me, he goes, so just like go down? I go, just go down, man. <laughs> and he went down, he baptized himself, and he looked at me and he smiled, and his family was out here, friends were out here, and he was like, this is awesome. This is awesome, finding your way back to God. Maybe a resource for you. Now, maybe you're following Jesus, but you would like to know more about this. So I'm gonna give you a deep resource. This is the next resource. This is a book called Return of the Prodigal Son by one of my favorite authors, Henry Nouwen. He is a deceased Dutch Catholic priest who's not a really, not really a good Catholic, to be honest with you. This is a phenomenal read, deep, but phenomenal. Maybe those books are too deep for you. So I want to give you a third option. And that third option is, a, is this book. I really like slop. 
This is uh, Chandler, our seven-year-old. She loves this book. Now, if you've read the parable of the prodigal son, you'll get this joke. I really like slop. This is Piggy, and this is his friend, Gerald the Elephant, and Chandler loves these books. She literally read this book to me like three weeks ago, and I was like, I gotta bring this up in the parable of the prodigal son. So let's jump into Luke 15. There's your resources. It's actually a good book. You should check it out. All right, there's your resources. Luke 15, setting's the same. The setting is the same. We have the, the uh, who do we have? We have the tax collectors, we have the sinners, whatever that means. We have the Pharisees and we have the teachers of the law. So we got the not so religious and we got the super religious over here. And they're all standing around listening to Jesus teach. Jesus shared the parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin. Both parables draw the same conclusion, which is Jesus really, really, really cares for that which is lost. Our conclusion, Jesus cares for people who are yet to know Jesus deeply, deeply, same conclusion. Jesus is gonna share a third parable with them. This is the two-parter, the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. How do we know that Jesus really cares for lost people? Because it's the heart of the gospel. You may not know any verses of scripture, period, but I bet you've heard at least one. What do you think that one would be? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to what? To condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus loves lost people. Let's jump in. Luke 15, verse 11, Jesus continued. Continued from what? From the other two parables. He said, there was a man who had two sons. We got two sons in here. The younger one said to his father, father, Give me my share of the estate. And so he divided the property between them. Now, this is, this is a cultural piece. First century Judaism, a son, if you had two sons, the older son would get two-thirds of the father's estates, and the younger son would get one-third of the father's estate. It was important to be born first, right? And so the younger son goes and asks for one-third of his father's estate. But here's the thing. The estate would only be divided up when, when something happened. What would that be? When the father died when he passed. And so this son goes up and he says, hey, give me what's coming to me. Yeah, I know you're still alive. I don't care. Uh, you know, I, I pretty much wish you were dead. Just give me what's coming to me. This is what happens. He goes on to say this, verse 13, not long after that. So he gets what's coming to him and he's ready to roll. The younger son got together all that he had, one third of his father's stuff, set off for a distant country, not a neighboring country, not the next town, he was getting out of Dodge. He knew what he was gonna do. And there he squandered his wealth, it's not his wealth, it's actually his father's wealth, in wild sinful living. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. Guess what? He didn't expect that. He didn't expect a famine. Doesn't lie, life doesn't always work out the way that we think it's gonna work out, right? Good or bad. There was a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. I bet you he did, because he squandered it all. Go to the next verse. I think it's verse 15. It says, so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into fields to feed pigs. We'll get back to that in a second. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. He longed to eat slop. That's what he longed to do. But no one gave him anything. Yes, someone did give him something. His father gave him one third of his estate. And his father is probably wealthy in this parable. We'll see this here in a second as well. So he has nothing. Let's pick up on a couple of things here. One, he squandered one third of his father's wealth. Two, he goes to a distant country. And three, he just took a job doing what? Feeding pigs. Remember the context of these three parables. Jesus is Jewish, right? The context is Jewish. Tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, teachers of the law. This is a Jewish context. What is the last job a Jewish person would probably take? Feeding pigs. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound all that kosher to me. This guy is just taking a job feeding pigs. Feeding pigs. He's wallowing in pig slop. He doesn't have enough food to eat. I bet you when he's there, he's thinking to himself, this is not how I thought this was going to go. Usually sin doesn't go the way that we think it's going to go. 
Usually when we walk away from God, when we walk away from the Father, it doesn't go the way that we think it's going to go. We think we got a good idea. We think we know what we're doing. But sin, sin takes us further than we want to go. And it usually keeps us longer than we want to stay. That's what's happening here. And so he sits there and he thinks to himself, okay, I, 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 maybe I better do something about this. So let's roll on to the next verse. I believe it's verse 17. He says this, when he came to his senses, <laughs> well, starvation will do that to you, right? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men, his father has hired men, so his father's probably got some money, how many of them have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Here's what I'm going to do, verse 18. I'm going to set out and I'm going to go back to my father, back to my father, and I'm going to say to him this, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against God, and against you. I know that I'm no longer worthy to be called your son because of what I've done. Because I essentially looked at you and said, Dad, I don't care if you're dead or alive. Get what's coming to me. Give me what's coming to me because I'm going to go wasted on how I think life should be lived. He said, I'm not worthy to be called your son, but would you do this for me? Would you just make me like one of your hired men? What is he doing? What is the younger son doing? Right here, right now, he is deciding, he is deciding to go back to his father. I think it's safe to say that he's hit rock bottom, right? He's hit rock bottom. He said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my father and maybe, perhaps maybe my father will forgive me. I'm going to ask for forgiveness and I know I've done too much to be welcomed back as a son, but maybe he'll just hire me out so I have food in my stomach and maybe somewhat of a roof over my head because it ain't going to work over here in this distant country. When we look at the parable of the prodigal son, there's three characters and we're going to see three perspectives. The perspective of the father, which I think is the most important. The perspective of the prodigal son, the lost son, and then the perspective of the older brother, which we'll see next week. But the son is at rock bottom. He said, I'm just going to go back and see if he'll welcome me back. Here's the thing. We've all actually been here before. We have. Now, maybe our story wasn't this bad. Maybe our story was worse. But think about this. We've all actually looked God the Father in the face, in the face and said, I, I may or may not, but... For a lot of us, I understand that this is what you want, God, but this is what this, I, I see that, but this is what I want to do. Thank you, and I'm going the other way. We've all done this. What's it called? Sin. Literally to miss the mark. We've done this. And here's the thing. When, when, when we do this, we do intentionally turn our back to God. Now, some of our stories aren't as bad as this. Some of our stories are even worse than this. But here's the thing. The story, the parable of the prodigal son teaches us, yes, about the two boys, but more importantly about the father. And so we're going to see what the father does. Comes to his senses, he's going to come back, and he is going to experience God's grace. God's grace. You see, as we do life with our one, as we do life with our one, as we relate to our family, our friends, our neighbors, whoever it is, people in our community that are yet to know Jesus, please understand this. They do not need God's judgment. Please hear this. I'm going to get worked up here. I'm going to take a breath. They don't need God's judgment. What they're looking for is God's grace, whether they know it or not. They're looking for God's grace. If you are a follower of Jesus, please hear me on this. Perhaps you've experienced this the way that I've experienced this. The closer I get to Jesus, the more I realize how much of God's grace I actually need. My friends and my family and my neighbors who are yet to know Jesus, they don't need God's judgment. And they definitely don't need my judgment. They, they need to see God's grace. They need to see Jesus, the perfect extension of God's grace. And he's asked me as his follower to, to live a life that extends that grace. And yes, I know there's things in, in life and in the world and in your neighborhood and in the schools and everything that, like that, that that are off. I know that. I know that. 
I know there's things in legislation that make us tingle. I know that. It's an extension of grace. And we do that day by day, minute by minute, as we do life with people who are yet to know Jesus, especially those that we have a relationship with. I need God's grace. And my friends need God's grace. I just need to be careful when I, I want to sit on the seat of God's judgment. I need to be careful there because I'm not worthy to sit there. So I ask myself, do I extend God's grace or do I extend God's misplaced judgment that I think needs to come through me? I can't get on a soapbox here, so let's roll. Next verse, verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, he's made his decision. He's come to his senses And so he gets up, he goes to his father. Look what happens. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and he slapped his son. He didn't do that. No, he threw his arms around his son and he kissed him. Look at what happens here. This is why I say the father is the main character in this parable. It says when he was still a long way off. That's what Jesus says while he was still a long way off. So we conclude a couple things here. We can conclude. One, the father is looking for him. He's looking for him. He's out on the front stoop, and he's looking across his land to see if maybe his son has, has come to his senses. And decide. He's looking for him. And then when he sees him, what does he do? He's filled with compassion, and he runs for him. When he comes to him, he embraces him. That's why I love the, Rem, the Rembrandt praying. He embraces him, and he welcomes him back as a son. You see, this is, this is why we use the phrase, my friends who are yet to know Jesus. I am beyond convinced that when my friends, when my family, when the people that I love, when the people that, that I do life with that are yet to know Jesus, when they come to realize that God sees them, that God is looking for them, not in a judgmental way, in a loving way, that he will have compassion for them, and he will embrace them, I'm convinced that they won't be able to help but to come to know Jesus. They have never experienced anything in their life like what it means to have a relationship with Jesus that comes through grace, that comes through grace. And this is what happens. The father shows us this. He says this, the the last couple verses here, verse 21, the son said to his father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Look at what the father does. He's the extension of our father God. It says, but the father said to his servants, quick, quick, bring the best robe. You don't put your best robe on the worker. You put the best robe on your son, right? He welcomes him back as a son and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Why? Look at what happens here. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast in church. We cannot cannot miss this word and let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost, just like the lost sheep, just like the lost coin. He was lost and now he's found. So they begin to, in church, I want to say this word together. Ready? Three, two, one. They begin to celebrate. Celebrate. Now, you may have been with us the last couple of weeks and you say, okay, Jay, I get it. I get that the one, that the one is important to Jesus and they're important to me. I get that Jesus loves the one. And I get that I love the one. I do, I do life with them. But here's my question, Jay. How do I help my one come to know Jesus? How do I help in this? I know I don't save them, but how do I help? Very valid question. So we're gonna get to that a little bit. But like we said in week one, this is not an exact science. If I knew the 25 things you could absolutely do to help somebody come to know Jesus and guaranteed that they would come to know Jesus, I would have gave them to you years ago. But it doesn't work that way. But let me give you just a few things that are helpful. So you ready for this? Let's get practical here. Number one, it's gonna sound really churchy, but it's not meant to be churchy. It's meant to be right at the heart of what it means to follow Jesus and follow Jesus together. Number one, we have to pray for them. Do not underestimate the power of prayer, especially when it comes to somebody knowing Jesus. You see, Jesus is pursuing them, but there's a spiritual battle there because Satan, the last thing Satan wants to happen in your one's life is for them to come to know Jesus. We have to pray for them. If you know them well, First, middle, and last name. Write it down. 
in a prayer journal. Pray for them. Prayer connects our heart to God. That's the awesome thing with prayer. And then through prayer, God connects my heart with my one's heart. And that's when some really cool things start to happen. Second, this is the easiest part of it. Relate to them. The overwhelming majority of us, are, we're already doing this. Relate with them. Do life with them. Have dinner with them. Have fun with them. Enjoy things with them. I don't know what you do. Work out with them. You know, uh, coach a ball team with them. Just do life with them. You know, for some of us that have been following Jesus for a long time, you may ask yourself this question. Am I doing life with anybody who is yet to know Jesus? Can I ask that question? If you're not, you need to start praying for somebody, for God to bring somebody in your life that, that is yet to know Jesus. Maybe we've been a little bit too sheltered. Pray for them, relate to them. And then the third one, this is the hardest one, I'll just tell you flat out, share with them. Everybody just went, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm not saying you sit there and go through every scripture in the Bible with them. Share with them about your relationship with Jesus, your faith in Jesus, why you believe in Jesus. Just share with them when the opportune time comes. You know, for some of us, we look for the perfect opportunity. The perfect opportunity doesn't come. Here's why. Because when you get knee to knee with somebody, you know, over a Friday night dinner or hanging out or something like that, when you get knee to knee with somebody who's yet to know Jesus and you think, hey, I, 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 maybe I should tell them about Jesus. You're going to get nervous. Believe me, you're going to get nervous. It's okay. It's not the perfect opportunity. It's just an opportunity. Share with them about why you have hope and faith in Jesus. And don't worry about not having all the questions to all the answers because you're not going to. There was one person that had all the answers to all the questions, and guess what? We're not him. We're not him. And then finally, when they take steps towards Jesus, or when they come to know Jesus, we have to celebrate. Church, we have to celebrate. We have to celebrate that. Everybody starts somewhere. I had a really good friend of mine shared this early in the series that, that came to know Jesus I don't know, a few weeks ago, you know, a month or so ago. And, and my friend had no faith background whatsoever. He didn't grow up going to church. He didn't grow up going to his grandma's church, to his parents' church, no church. He said, Sundays, we were either skiing when it was cold or golfing when it was, when it was warm. And he came to know Jesus. Why? Because friends of his who already knew Jesus invested into his journey with Jesus. He came here one Sunday afternoon, and my man brought like 40 friends with him. And he was baptized here after church one Sunday. And I kid you not, of the 40 friends... 30 of them had never made the decision that he made to give his life to Christ, to be baptized into Christ, and to be all in. And it was a celebration. I'm still celebrating it in my heart. When someone comes to know Jesus, we have to celebrate. Church, that is the number one thing that we have to celebrate as a follower of Jesus, is when somebody else comes, comes into a forever, eternal relationship with Jesus. Celebration is huge. Here's the thing. Next week, we're going to see someone who doesn't celebrate, and that's the older brother. That's the older brother. Be with us, and also anticipate Easter with us. It's coming up. Let me pray for us, and we'll move into a time of communion. Lord, thank you so much that when we came to know you, you were celebrating. And here's the cool thing. For, for the overwhelming majority of us, we didn't come to know Jesus on our own. There were people along the way that helped us come to know Jesus. And when we came to know Jesus, they celebrated with us. Lord, may we invest into those who we love dearly who are yet to know Jesus. And we trust your spirit that you will lead and guide us in those times, in those experiences, in those conversations. It's in Christ's name we pray this. Amen.